Good morning, everyone, and welcome to CMM Live. It is Thursday, January 30th, 2018. I can't believe we're in 2018 uh, uh, already. Uh, my name is Joe Campolo, your host, and as you know, here at CMM Live, what we try to do are bring uh, Long Island's best and brightest, the, the, the thought leaders that are helping to uh, transform and maintain the Long Island uh, economy. And today we have an incredibly uh, special guest, uh, you know, uh, Teresa Ferraro from East West Industries. She's the president. It's a family-owned business. They're in the manufacturing and defense and aerospace uh, industries. And you've been doing this for a couple of years now, uh, haven't you? Just a few, but thank you so much, Joe, for having me here today. Yeah, it's great. So we met uh, several years ago, and mm -hmm. uh, and and Dad was uh, Dad was running the business at that time, and I can Correct. remember being in that in that conference Small room and conference room. Yep, and having these uh, having these conversations, and I remember thinking to myself. You know, everybody's talking about how the manufacturing, defense, aerospace industries here on Long Island are, are dying and are dead and went away with, uh, with Grumman. But then I met you guys and I was like, wow, they are really doing cool stuff. They're really leaders in this industry. They're going to go places. And, uh, and you certainly did. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, your history and the company's history so we can understand sure, that. Sure. Thank you so much. So, yes, East West. Uh, we are a manufacturer, an engineering manufacturing firm. We produce life support and ground support equipment, uh, primarily for the military. Uh, the focus has been on all military aircraft. We are dipping our toe into the commercial area, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but we are excited because we are celebrating our 50th year in business. Um, yes, Mom and Dad founded East West in 1968. Um, Mom talks about it till today, yeah. right on their dining room table, right in Wantor, in the house that they still live in. Um, designing small components, um, oxygen systems, connectors, things like that, um, and then kind of flourishing the business uh, to where it is today with a very diverse product line and customer base as well. Yeah, so it's great. So first of all, I want to say thank you because as a, as a former uh, active duty serviceman, uh, you know, technology and equipment that's designed to help protect, mm -hmm. you know, our servicemen and women's lives is, is incredibly important. And I don't think that you guys get enough credit, f you know, for that. Well, we should be thanking you because really what our motto is, saving aircrew lives is our first concern. And that has been the guiding tenant since the start of the business. And it truly is, it's very critical because what we do is make sure that uh, the men and women that are volunteering and, you know, going into the military nowadays, our products bring them home safely. Uh, everyone knows a mother, father, brother, sister, cousin, neighbor that is serving in the military and our products touch those lives. And it's very important for us to make sure that they come back home safely. Yeah, and that's, that's truly commendable. It's a great way to spend a career. It really, it really is a great way to, uh, you know, to spend a career. So let's talk a little bit. You know, we have a lot in, uh, in today's headlines about women executives and the Me Too movement and everything mm -hmm. else. And here you are, a woman running a uh, you know, manufacturing and defense contracting mm -hmm. uh, a business. But what's that experience been like for you over the years? So I will tell you, you know, are there struggles? Absolutely. Um, I'm 35 years in the business. So, so you got in at two. I got in at two. Yes, Thank absolutely. you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, there have been struggles, but nothing that I feel could not be overcome. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I work side by side with my father, who was my father, my friend, and my mentor. And that was very important for 30 years. I really um, was able to get that founding, you know, those foundations that were very important to going ahead and becoming successful. And so I had a little bit of a, a, a double whammy of not only being a woman in business, but I was also the boss's daughter. Right. So that was also something to overcome. But what I found is that if you're passionate about what you do, if you really truly have a belief in your product and your commitment to the customer, because ultimately, who is our customer? The customer isn't the Sikorsky's and the Boeing's and the Lockheed's, it's the servicemen and women. Correct. And we, the guiding tenant of saving air crew lives is very critical um, because what we're manufacturing and what we're doing goes into an aircraft a seating system, a helicopter seat, fixed wing seats, oxygen systems, things of that nature. Um, and it was very critical for me to learn from the ground up 
So I gain the respect of my team at East West, but then use those same principles within the market, dealing with those large prime customers. And once they understand that you're meeting the, the needs of you know, on-time delivery, you know, good quality, good product, on-time delivery, um, you begin to have that respect and learn to, you know, to mold yourself into that, into that uh, business. Yeah, and it's, it, I, I'll go back to our first meeting. I remember how uh, knowledgeable and professional you were, especially when you gave me the, the site tour, you mm -hmm. know? And it, it always resonates that you're one of the top business leaders I've ever met, who also happens to be a woman. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really, from the way I've seen everybody in the business community interact with you, it's a, it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful statement. Well, thank I mean, you. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. I try to really follow those, those you know, those foundations of, you know, treating people with respect as well, too, and, uh, and that carries forward, so, but thank you. Yeah, so it's great. So, so how did it, so you said mom and dad were at their dining room, uh, at their dining room table. What was the, what was their experiences? What, why this business? How did it start? Well, dad was in the business. He was a degreed mechanical engineer, worked for other firms that he was doing engineering and sales, uh, and they had three small children at the time. And they really decided it was, you know, he's a true entrepreneur and said, I'm doing this for someone else. And he was traveling more and more, less time at home. My mother had a financial background. He had the engineering and sales, which is a very um, unusual combination. Usually, you know, an engineer yeah. is very strict, but he really had that sales and marketing side for him. And they really said to themselves, you know, let's, let's branch out and do this on our own and start designing some of the components that are still in use today. He's developed many patents for the items. We have 28 patents to the, wow. to the name, to East West name. Um, and really de developed a team around him that could start, you know, start to where we are. Started with small components, always focusing on life support, uh, which is very critical. People say, you know, during military times, you know, are there cutbacks? Or there's not many people that are going to say, well, let's forget about saving someone's life. Let's cut back on that equipment. So Yeah, I think, I think it angers everybody when politics try to play on service men and women's lives. Like Absolutely. With the recent shutdown. So it's a great thing. So what's been, the, what's been the changes that you've seen in 35 years, right? Long Island's completely changed. The economy has completely changed. Yet you guys have managed to survive all of those uh, right. all of those changes. So, so what have you seen, and what have you guys done to make sure that you've made viable? So, one of the biggest things that we always focused on was diversity. Um, that we needed to make sure that our product line was diverse, uh, diverse enough that it was just not focusing on one branch of the military, one type of aircraft. Uh, we made sure that when we focus on something, we could work on helicopter seating fixed wing seating, oxygen systems, ground support, and then diversified with the primes, with the customers, because as we know, you know, customers get, one gets gobbled up by the other, so don't put all your eggs in one basket, but diversify, but keep a sound financial hold on what you have within, and I think we, we really focused ourselves within the market. We always tried to stay very local within our community, supporting our local suppliers, because we thought that that was very important. If we're successful, we want to make them successful along with us. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very impressed because I'm sure in your, your space, so you recently just bought a building, which mm -hmm. is a gorgeous facility. Thank you. You stayed here on Long Island, and I'm sure for you guys that's a difficult decision at times because there are plenty of other states trying to lure exactly who and what you guys do away and gave great uh, incentive packages. Mm -hmm. um, so talk about that a little bit because I think a lot of businesses are struggling with that and talk about how you guys you know, went through that process and made the decision to stay here. So one of the critical components to East West that makes us very uh, successful are our employees. And we've grown from, I think when we first met, we were probably about 40, 45 employees over the years. We're now at 79 employees. But what we realized is the core competency of our employees. There was a tribal knowledge that if we moved and we went out of state, you would lose a lot of that tribal knowledge. We know from some of the other primes that have moved off Long Island, yeah. it's been very difficult to be able to, to, rate, to maintain that. So, was it a struggle? Absolutely, because we needed to be competitive not only with our employees' uh, packages and medical packages and 401k and things, but we wanted to make sure that we really, we, we really focused and stayed within our core competency and stayed as lean as possible. Yeah, it's, um, it's hard to do, right? Because you can chase so many rabbit holes mm -hmm. and uh, 
it's hard to stay focused there. But I hear a lot of Long Island uh, business owners and business leaders talk about how difficult it is to attract and retain talent here on Long Island. What, is, what have been your experiences and what are you guys doing to make sure that you're keeping your employees uh, happy? So we're keeping the employees happy, but as far as we started to talk about a little bit of recruitment of how you yeah. begin to um, you know, increase that workforce. Again, who is the end user of our product? Um, someone in the military. When they get out of the military, you know, coming back into civilian society is also a very big transition. But what we recognized is there's many military personnel that have touched our equipment, have sat on our equipment, breathed from the oxygen yeah. system, survival. You know, um, bringing them back within the market uh, and giving them a job, and also transferring that knowledge to the employees that currently work there, it's a, it's a very good combination. Yeah, so that's, that's, to me, that's God's work, right? Mm -hmm. you, we send these, uh, these poor men and women overseas to, to fight wars. Uh, they come back and they have no jobs, no trainings, mm -hmm. no opportunities. And now you guys have made a big commitment to, uh, to hiring veterans and, and stuff Absolutely. like that. So it's win it sounds like it's win-win along, uh, you know, along those lines, which is, which is fantastic. So your personal philosophy, so... Uh, uh, I know Dad passed away uh, not too long ago, mm -hmm. and, and you took over the company, and yes. I'm sure that that was um, a very difficult transition, but talk about that a little bit, because I think, particularly here on Long Island, we find a lot of family-owned businesses that struggle with succession planning, that mm -hmm. struggle with how to keep the vision and the mission alive and the spirit alive, so just talk about that if you don't mind. So, you know, we talk about 35 years ago when I entered the business. Um, if, when I went to college and I came out, if someone said to me, you'll be working you know, for your parents, wasn't the thing. I, right. When I came out of college, I was going to make my mark. Um, the beauty of what I was able to experience was you know, at the ripe old age of you know, 22, you get out and you meet someone that the products that your parents' company designed and developed brought them home safely. And they were there to shake your hand to say, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for answering the phone. Thank you for packing. Thank you for inspecting whatever it was. Thank you for saving my life. It was life changing at that time. So it was very um, instrumental for me to see that. But also, going, you know, starting with the business, we talk about when I entered in, my core focus was business administration and human resource management. At that time, it was called personnel. It right. wasn't called human resources. Um, and that we were a small family-owned business at that time. Didn't have a real complex benefit package. So I designed and developed that. But I noticed at that time that, yes, recruiting was part of it, but learning the core business, learning the contracts, learning the financial end, being out on the floor, talking with the employees that are putting that product together right. to gain that full knowledge. So as time went on, I really developed and learned that, um, you know, it was, it gets me excited to get up every day to go to work. It's a, it's a challenge, but it's not a challenge if you surround yourself by the right people um, and you have a good team behind you, it becomes very easy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's the most rewarding thing Absolutely. in life. It, re it really is. So I have a, uh, an almost 20-year-old daughter. She'll be 20 in about a week and a half, which I, I can't believe, mm -hmm. you know, I, um, and Should I, I say c congratulations or good luck? Right? <laughs> Both. <laughs> but so she's in college and she's sort of struggling, right? Where, mm -hmm. where does a young woman go? What do I do? You know, so what advice do you have for those, uh, those millennial Gen Zs mm -hmm. out there that are, that are struggling, particularly for non-traditional? I would say yours is a non-traditional female role by mm -hmm. older standards, right? right? But here you are, and you're, uh, you're on top of the world, and you're doing a great job. So what's the advice you can give these young women out there? Well, the biggest thing I can say is find a mentor. It's so important. And it doesn't have to be uh, a mentor you know, within an occupation that you want. But find someone that you have a chemistry with. And I really believe that getting this, you know, this younger generation, they, you know, they're so tech savvy, but sometimes they're not out there. They're not interacting with people to find out what's a passion that you love to do. And January, I think, was you know National Mentoring Month, right. and you know I really believe that our schools are are failing, and whether they're at middle school, high school, or even college level, getting those those students out there to find a mentor. And we have plenty of people that we kind of welcome that in, working closely with the Girl Scouts and local community colleges, that if you ask some of those students manufacturing, 
what are they thinking of? Oh, smokestacks, dirty, ugly, right. you know. Bring them in, show them that, hey, college is not for everybody, but if you have a mentor, you can spark some of that creativity and that imagination that might draw them into an area that they never thought they'd be exposed to. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm right with you on that. I'm a firm believer in mentoring. Without mentors, every critical point of my life, I wouldn't be where I am mm -hmm. today because Absolutely. it's just been, you know, folks that are uh, that are mentoring. And so what about for you, right? So what do you do to keep your, you know, your sanity? What do you do to keep your, uh, uh, you know, your professional development? How do you, how do you hold it all together? Because it's tough, right? It's, it's, it is. It's, it's tough. It's definitely a juggling act. Um, I know this year, especially coming up to our 50th anniversary and the success that we've had with the growth, everyone's pulling us in different directions. Again, I lead with the heart. I really stay focused on the avenues that I have a draw to and um, you know, really kind of keep the balance that way. Um, but it's, you know. It's tough. So tough. one of the things that our, that our um, viewers are always interested in is a typical day, mm -hmm. right, and time management. Mm -hmm. So you obviously have a million things to get done. You have to prioritize things. You have to allocate time yep. to those things. So just talk about, and it probably there is never a typical day, but talk about a typical day and how you deal with the pressures of time management and getting your priorities So done. first of all, I'm a big believer in lists. Mm -hmm. I think it's not only to organize your day, but there's also a level of success when you've accomplished a task and it makes you go on to the next. So crossing something off the list. What I try to do is when I get in the morning, of course, we all need to go through the emails, and I'm sure you're the same way. Right. They can go on forever. Yes. But you prioritize. But what I need to do is I try to meet with kind of my top staff mm -hmm. early on in the day. What are the avenues that we need to approach right away? And also customers that need a little bit of attention. As we all know, there's, you know, in the military, there's products that are at the forefront right now hypoxia and in the aircraft is a is a very critical issue sure. it's probably the number one program of um, you know of recognition right now that we need to focus on and we are working closely with the navy so we need to understand that Certain customers need to be responded to right away. Um, I have a really good team. I have a great family support, right. first of all, and I think that's that's most important. Absolutely. Uh, but a good team support as well, too. And sometimes do you feel like you're putting out a lot of fires? Absolutely. Um, so the day never ends, really. It starts from early morning to yep. late at night. It's a it's a myth that once you become the, uh, the top person, you mm -hmm. can kick back and just enjoy it. You seem like... For me, anyway, I'm just dealing with problems all day long, but that's the point of right. the job, right, mm -hmm. is to be dealing with the problems mm -hmm. and helping to, uh, Solve you know, the to problems. resolve them, right. Mm -hmm. So what would, you, what would you describe your management philosophy as? What, you know, what is it that you, uh, your values that you hold you and your team accountable for and your company accountable for? What are, what are, the, what are the values in, in your management philosophy? Well, they all have to, first of all, and I believe our team does, really focuses on what our guiding tenant is. Mm -hmm. Um, but I believe in listening. Listening is very key. We're all great. Everyone says, oh, I listen to what he says, but are you really, are you really hearing what they're saying? And whether that's my top team manager saying a problem that's on the floor, a problem with the product, kind of communication and listening, very, very key. Yeah, Grandma always says, uh, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, Exactly. Right? That's exactly, uh, exactly it. You know, I was just thinking as we were talking, and I wonder if this was uh, something you guys have gone through, although I'm sure you probably have. So I can tell you, when I was, when I was in the Marine Corps in 1989, we were in uh, Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, in a training exercise, a chopper went down, and 19 of my fellow Marines were killed during a training exercise, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's very touching and tragic and everything else. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, when those things come up, if they're products of yours or other things of yours, you know, how that affects you guys. It must have an impact there when you see that, right? It does, and um, it's true. When you hear that, I think everybody's ears are perked up at the office and get a quick notification. Um, what I really think is we focus on, and a lot of, of our customers focus on, um, the lives that it saves. Yeah. 
more than what we've lost. And people say, well, you know, your survival kit in that F-18, you know, oh, you know, sits, could sit dormant for years. But when it needs to work, absolutely, it needs to work right the first time. And the same thing with our helicopter seats. Um, we did meet uh, General Crosby from, our, from the Army, and he had come to visit the facility, and he was uh, exiting out of his career. And he came into East West to shake the hands of every employee because he said when he entered, he was sitting in a CH-47 Chinook on cardboard boxes and igloo coolers. Wow. He's now exiting his career knowing that the men and women that are flying in those are now in, a, in, a, in an attenuating seat that if there is a hard landing, you know, they, the seat is absorbing the energy and not the occupant and they're not getting thrown around the aircraft. So. Those, I think, are the things that I focus more on, the, the good that we're doing. Yeah, and that's, that's a great perspective, mm -hmm. you know, to have. It, it really is. Um, technology. So technology in your industry must be rapidly developing with 3D printers and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff going on, right? So, so talk about that and the challenges, because technology always creates challenges for organizations. Absolutely. Right? Um, so our engineering team, they're always at the forefront. Again, we're in engineering manufacturing. So we identify the customer's problems or pain points and then what engineering does is they design and develop a product that we can then manufacture to meet those needs. Um, we all know engineers, you know, they want to stay at the at the cutting edge of things and we've actually reached out to people, you know, we've gone to Empire State Development, worked on local grants to assist small businesses in bringing some of that technology like 3D printers, like um, CNC um, machines, uh, coordinate measuring mach machines, things that the state has recognized let us help the small business acquire this equipment um, and to be able to put it into use. And uh, that's really worked very well. Yeah, that's really exciting. So what's next, right? So you have all this growth going on, a new facility. Mm -hmm. um, What's next? What do, you, what do you see as next? I mean, uh, we're so excited for you, but what do you see as sort of the next thing on the horizon? So we're always thinking ahead. We always need to figure out, you know, our programs that we um, commit to are long-term. They're multi-year programs. The government doesn't want to come back every year no. and, and re, uh, requalify something. So we're out there for years. We're out there 2022, 2026, um, but we need to think forward. And that's where um, the business development, the marketing team, the engineering team identifies, you know, what's in the future? Is it unmanned aircraft? Could be, right. but I think there's still way too much, you know, that's, that's too far out. And understand the types of new aircraft that are getting developed. And we've situated ourselves to work hand in hand with a lot of those prime customers to, to be on those cutting edge programs, those new platforms. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I didn't really think about unmanned aircraft and drones and mm -hmm. how that all impacts the, uh, the industry, but it has to have some impact on it, right? It will, but we'll still have men and women that are have going to, to get yeah. transported, yeah, whether the aircraft is manned or not. There's, there's no, no doubt about that. It, and we also recognize that our focus has always been the military, that that's really been our end user. Um, but a few years ago, we've really focused on dipping our toe into the commercial market. So we're working with Bell Helicopter on the Bell 505, which is the replacement for the Bell 206, which is wow. the largest lightweight helicopter out there um, in production. The 505, they believe, will you know, supersede whatever the 206 has yeah. done. But the Bell 505 program, it, we've, they wanted us to utilize our military types of structures in order into the seats onto those helicopters. But again, those helicopters are used for either transporting firefighters to fires or oil riggers or VIPs that wanted it. So the helicopter is developed that when they order the helicopter, they can either ask for a VIP seat or a utility seat. What we found is everyone that's ordering that helicopter from Bell is asking for both seats because of that, again, they want to be diverse in what their customer base is as well. So we've really focused ourselves into the commercial market too, which is a whole new area for us. That really is. That's really interesting that you guys have migrated there. So is it the same sort of business development process? So I'm sure the government's a lot of RFP or contract work, mm -hmm. right? So what about in the commercial space? Are you finding that you had to change your marketing and business development for that? Uh, we did. We incorporated a lot into it, but um, you know, it was a it was a whole new animal to us. And uh, there is a lot with 
once we've been qualified on a military platform, we've tried to use that technology on commercial platform, which of course has become very successful for that commercial customer, that they now have those types of um, requirements right. flow down. Yeah, in a past life I used to work for a, for a video conferencing company that did a lot of business with the government in terms mm -hmm. of video security systems and stuff like that. And it was always very hard when you're working on municipal type of contracts and yes. solutions to reinvent yourself and go into the commercial space. And so right. many companies do it and can't can't succeed because they are two different animals. Two different animals, totally. Yeah. It's a different type of you know thinking. Again, the military qualifications and restrictions are much higher than commercial. Um, but I do think that Bell was very wise in understanding that those were critical functions that to be passed along to their to their platform was important. So yes. Yeah, so uh, last question: the the Long Island, the national economies, right? How do you mm -hmm. feel about it? What are you what are you seeing? You know, there's a, there's a lot of turmoil in our country, but, but the economy seems strong. What are, your, what are your thoughts on it? Absolutely. We have really increased our supplier base um, tremendously. And yes, there is a lot of turmoil, but I do, I do see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we need to stay focused. You need to stay lean. Um, and I think more businesses nowadays are, are looking to partner with East West because they see the type of growth that we're experiencing so yeah truly remarkable you guys are, you guys are truly not just a Long Island success story but a national success story you, re you. you really are uh, I commend you for the amazing work that you uh, that you guys do it with the high level of ethics and integrity uh, that you do it with it really is a breath of fresh air to see well, thank you. to see the good guys win you know it, it, it really is uh, folks, we were joined today by Teresa Ferraro, the president of East West Industries, who is here today to tell us Long Island manufacturing, defense, aerospace is alive and well and growing. The economy is doing well and growing, and she sees nothing but good things on the horizon uh, for all of us. So thank you today for, uh, for joining us. I think we have a very nice uh, clip of your company now that we're going to play. I just want to thank you for joining us Thanks today. Thanks so much, Joe. I really appreciate really it. Really very great.
to CMM Live. My name is Joe Campolo, your host, and we have such an amazing uh, treat today. We had uh, earlier Teresa Ferraro from East West Industries um, talking about the defense and aerospace industry being alive and well uh, here on Long Island. And now we get to, uh, to spend some time with my, with my friend Rich Human, who's the president and CEO of H2M. Uh, engineers and architects here on Long Island, yep. and we're going to talk infrastructure, Rich. We're going to we're going to talk infrastructure. So welcome. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here, Jim. Yeah. So um, you know, for our viewers, they uh, they want to get to know you a bit. Sure. Um, you know, we try to spotlight uh, the Long Island thought leaders who are really making an impact in critical uh, critical areas, and um, you know, infrastructure to me, you know, is the most critical area because we talk a lot about sewers development and all this other stuff and no, nobody really knows you know the challenges so yeah. we're going to get to all that but just talk a little bit about h2m give yourself a, a little shameless plug here for uh, <laughs> for a couple of minutes shameless you know? plug shameless all plug good. absolutely uh, so yeah we're a uh, a full service architectural and engineering company uh entering our 85th year uh, so we started in 1933 as a long island company uh, founded in the, the basement of a Bethpage home by uh, Gus Holzmacher, and I'm the, I guess, fifth president and CEO of the firm over that period. Uh, I started working there in 1988 as a college intern, so I was interning there, uh, and then kind of worked my way up. Uh, as so it's the only job you've ever had, huh? Is it besides H2O? working in 7-Eleven and the post office in high school, uh, working in the sack room and, and dealing wow. with all the dirty, the dirty sacks. Yeah, my whole career has been at H2M. Uh, and I, I like to talk to people about not only my own story, because I think it, it, it tells such a, uh, a great tale of, of H2M, but um, a company that if you're, if you're willing to be a bit of an entrepreneur and, and maybe carve a pathway for yourself, uh, you can become the CEO at that company. Yeah. And I like to tell all the employees there that you can make you know, your career, whatever you like it to be at our company. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we specialize in architectural and engineering across the spectrum and all sorts of different markets, not just uh, water, wastewater and civil engineering, but um, we've got an architecture group over 120 architects and we do work for uh, school districts and fire districts, designing firehouses, EMS facilities, um, assisted living facilities. Uh, you know, we, we do the Bristol assisted living facilities. One of our Lead architects is the designer of those yep. facilities. Um, hotels. Hotels. Yeah, you know, we did the, uh, yeah. the Hilton Garden Inn yep, out of Stony sure. Brook. That was an H2N design. So, um, really, there's there's not much in the in the physical world from uh, infrastructure to building design that H2M doesn't do. Uh, and over the the last few years, we've been continuing to grow, continuing to take on you know, new responsibilities, new clients, uh, new staff. It's, it's really been a great time for us. Yeah, you guys are an incredible success story here, here on Long Island. I've been watching you guys for years, just the growth and the management and the leadership. So, so talk about that. So, you know, aspiring college graduates that are going yeah. into, uh, into a job. Now, we hear millennials like to bounce around and they don't, you know, but here we have a, uh, here we have a story of a college intern who went on to become CEO, which is pretty yeah. remarkable. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I, it, it honestly probably goes back to my father and my grandfather. Um, you know, my grandfather, after World War II, worked for a manufacturer's Hanover Trust for 40 years. That was it. Uh, my father worked for the U.S. Postal Service for 38 years. That was it. So I was always brought up, if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and work hard and be committed, you could do great things. So even though there were opportunities to maybe move and get into some other things, I never felt as though um, I was dissatisfied. And, you know, you can always look at the grass as greener someplace else, or, you know, if I continue to make moves, it's a way to kind of get myself up the ladder. If I jump around a little bit, to me, um, so much more of your character is displayed by commitment and dedication. And I always felt as though as long as H2M felt right to me, that I would continue to do everything I could to be successful, not only for myself, but for the company. And that's really the reason why I've been there for 30 years. Yeah, and it's, it's great. So, I mean, a lot of times in, uh, in corporate America, you know, they'll say people can rise by playing it safe and just sort of maneuvering through uh, bureaucracy, right? But you and I serve on uh, some boards together and we have some outside experiences together. And I see you as somebody, and one thing I truly admire about you is I see you as somebody who's willing to speak his mind, willing to take a risk, willing to, 
to say uh, when everybody else is sitting quiet around the table and you're not sure yeah. what their response is willing to be able to do that. And I truly, you know, admire that. So, so you know, what part of risk taking has it been in your, in your career at this point? Uh, I, I thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that because uh, to me, if we are who we are and you need to be able to express opinion and, and take risk, uh, I, I believe that our company has been, um, you know, through a very strong growth uh, period because of a little bit of risk we've been taking. Yeah. Uh, for a company that's been around for, for 85 years, uh, as a, you know, and even in the engineering field, you know, engineers are typically very conservative. We want to make sure that yeah. if there are 10 boxes to check, we check all 10 boxes before we go ahead and make decisions. Um, and I've decided that uh, you know, some appropriate risk is, is necessary if you really want to grow. And um, there are challenges and there are failures. And if you're afraid to fail, you won't take risk. And I'm not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid to uh, make mistakes. I'll learn when I do. Uh, but to me, those are the reasons why you can really drive your business and your own personal success if you want to take some risk. Right. So it's always hard. So, um, you know, with our last guest, she was saying in the defense industry, it's very dangerous to grow outside of your core competencies, right? So you get very conservative types of growth. But for you guys, you seem to have grown into many different areas now when that was by design was that by action and how, how did you guys was, map that all out that was know? that was by design that was uh i agree with her um so what we've done is we've expanded our core competencies you know if you're willing to relook at yourselves uh, you know just in our in, in the growth in our architectural practice it's it's not as though we're hiring lots of architects and getting into areas that we're not comfortable um, you know, I've made some acquisitions over the last few years where uh, we wanted to get into assisted living. And yep. there was an architectural firm, David Mamina Architects, who uh, was a leader in, in designing those types of facilities. So we brought him onto the team. Uh, we've, uh, we made an acquisition up in Albany, mm -hmm. uh, Pacheco Ross Architects. They are nationally renowned designers in, in the EMS uh, arena. So instead of trying to develop the skills, we started to build a relationship with this company right. and uh, create a great partnership there and just recently made a small acquisition, uh, ES Jack alone out in Farmingdale. Um, they've been architects, you know, for decades, you know, specializing in, in high-end design in, um, you know, residential uh, public agency work and some government work. So really it's been, you know, building resources, kind of fortifying what we do but looking at the right places to be able to expand so that you don't lose quality. Uh, and I think, you know, from uh, what I heard her talk about, you know, your concern is that you, you still want to be an expert. So if you grow too much, you know, and you, you might water down your expertise, yep. you know, we're trying to do both. We're trying yep. to grow, but maintain that high quality. Yeah, and that's, that's a challenge, right? So it's, I'm sure it's no different with engineers than it is with, the, with attorneys. You, you create a brand of uh, excellence and then talent can be a wild card sometime you sure. know so what is your guys process how involved in you in, in talent acquisition I mean I know there's a lot of talk about challenges in attracting talent so you know what sort of priority is it for you personally as CEO and, and for the organization uh, it's, it's priority number one next to maybe a couple other number ones right uh, it's no less than any other priority in the firm it's not also above a number of priorities. I think that, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time uh, with, with my HR director and her team talking about engagement with the staff, uh, constantly looking at ways that we could maybe evolve the business approach um, just from day-to-day -day management, from policy management. Uh, you know, our goal is to make our company a first-in-class best company to work for, uh, not just in the engineering architectural industry, but in any industry. Period, right, yep. Right, and that's the strive. Yep. So you strive for that, and you continue to work towards it. And uh, in dealing with um, not just generational complexities, but also just the complexities of individuals. You know, what motivates you might be different than what motivates me. And my job is to understand what motivates you, so that I could figure out a way to support you in your pathway in your career. And if you see that from me, especially as a CEO. Um, that I care about that and I want you to be successful, there's a good chance you're going to want to stay and, and, right. and grow with our company. 
Um, so I'm, I'm very involved there. You, you know, we've got a very robust internship program, you know, uh, intern. Absolutely. Uh, I know the value of that. So last summer we had 40 interns wow. working in our company. Um, and, you know, in all of our offices, we, we've got interns. And uh, what's great about it is it's a very robust program. We're getting the best and the brightest. So they come, they intern. It's kind of like a prolonged interview process. They see us. Yep. We see them. Uh, and then as they come close to graduation, we've got a, a great group of people that would, you know, be, be potential employees in the firm. Uh, we, we participate heavily in STEM scholarships. We have a STEM scholarship program where uh, we award to uh, six Long Island high school seniors that are going into some kind of science, technology, engineering, math program. Uh, and I have a ceremony in the office, and we invite them in and the families in, and, and we give them $1,000 each to kind of kick them off in their, uh, in their, their college career. Maybe yep. I'll set a little bit of the cost. College is through the roof, but uh, a little bit of the cost. So those are a number of things that we do. We, we understand that uh, our ability to go ahead and attract the best and the brightest is, is really going to be the basis of what we're all about. You know, you, you sell professional service, you sell people. I sell people, right? We get hired because of our people, yep. you know, not because of our name, not, you know, they want to, you know, who's working on my project. So it's, it's key. So training, right? So one of the challenges, and I'm sure with, uh, with architects and engineers, it's very similar to the challenges I have with attorneys, and that is they're very talented professionals, but in terms of, uh, perhaps sales or likability skills, sometimes it's a challenge to yeah. get these people to get you know, out of their shell a little bit and out of their comfort zone and just be you know, regular people. So, so how, do you, how do you work that? You know, is it through mentorship in your organization? Is it, is it through training? How do you guys deal with that? Um, so completely agree. Yeah. I think uh, engineers are, are to me, that, that's Introverts, the, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, highly analytical, mm -hmm. introverted in, in most cases. Um, but that can't stop you. Right. right. You need to just acknowledge that, recognize it, and, and figure out ways to develop some programs to, uh, to let them become trained and, and developed. And uh, we do have a, a pretty, pretty significant development program in the office where you know, we'll identify those that uh, need a little bit of growth in that area, uh, but also want to do that. Right. You know, you, you can't just across the board say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and try to put some business development skills into everybody. Um, you know, we need people that if, if, if they want to be really great designers, we need those people. Right. We need people to be highly technical, great designers. And if they have no interest in doing business development or, or networking themselves or getting into organizations, that's fine. We don't need everybody to do it. So we have open communications with all the staff. You know, those that show uh, some great initiative and they have intent, you know, yeah, they want to get out and meet clients more, we will mentor them. We'll have a, a program in place where if we have people that are active in organizations, we'll bring, you know, some younger staff along with us just to be exposed, get some experience, right. watch how other people do it. Uh, you know, it's always the most difficult thing is when you go into a new room and you know nobody in the room, well, how do I behave? What's the expectations of me? Uh, you know, what do I need to get at when I go back to the office tomorrow and I have a conversation with my supervisor and that person asks me, you know, so who'd you talk to last night? Uh, you know, there's pressure in that and there's uncomfortableness in that. So the more opportunities I think uh, people get to be exposed to those kind of situations, once it becomes a little more comfortable, a little more natural, uh, you do it great. <laughs> You're really mm -hmm. good at it. Uh, I think that there's um, a great ability, and I think engineers can uh, can do that kind of stuff. But where between our mentoring and our and our professional development programs, we're we're very key on uh, you know those aspects of of people. Right. So let's shift gears a little bit. So I think um, the last report I read was China, which has you know a population of over a billion people in the last five years got 30 million of their citizens above the poverty line based on infrastructure spending, right? And, and we know that China is going gangbusters in terms of building their infrastructure. And it seems like, you know, here on Long Island and in the United States, infrastructure spending is such, such a challenge. It's, yeah. it's just such a challenge. Um, it's, it seems like it. 
But tell us the real deal, right? Because what do I know? You know, <laughs> what, what do I know? I'm just, I'm just a layman that looks and sees it. Yeah. But do you agree with that? Do you agree there's a complacency here in the U.S. with regard to infrastructure spending, or are we, are we doing well? I, 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 are we doing well? We're not doing as well as we need to do. Okay. Uh, at this point, it, it really, it's not by choice anymore. It's, it's a have to have, not really a, a want to have, but a have to have. Uh, I think that, you know, you, you, you go through cycles, and we went through a period, uh, you know, post-World War I, post-Depression, uh, you know, you had the big deal. You had, um, you know, infrastructure in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s between, you know, interstate highways and bridges and water systems and wastewater systems were, were driving our economy. And, you know, anybody who takes a look at what our economic outlook was like, you know, in the, in the 50s and going to the 60s, it was, it was strong, right? Yeah. Um, so you put all that stuff in place. And you kind of go like this and you think you're done. That's where maybe complacency isn't, you know, the, 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 the proper word for it. But I think like, a, like, a, like a, a, you take a breath uh, and then you prioritize in other places. And I think as a country, we've prioritized in so many different places that now that the cycle is back towards there's a need to be able to, to fund and finance infrastructure in the country, we don't know where to get the money from, right? right? There were so many competing programs that um, uh, the political will is there. You hear it from, I'm sure the president in the state of the state is going to talk about infrastructure. You know, he campaigned on an infrastructure program. No money really came out. You know, so the word is, okay, now his trillion dollar plan should be coming out in 2018. Uh, you know, the governor has, has, has put as much funding into infrastructure as, you know, any governor has in, in the history of our state. You know, $200 billion just in water wastewater infrastructure. Um, local governments, you hear county executives talking about it. Uh, Laura Curran's talking about it. And Steve Alonso's talking about it, how important it is. So um, I think the political will is there at all levels. The need is clearly there. Uh, the, the ability for engineers and architects and contractors to execute the work is there. It's a matter of prioritizing the funding and making funding available. And, and unfortunately, uh, I think that's a, a bigger issue for us is um, to have the will to be able to put the money where it is and then have it recur there. You know, not one shot, but recurring funding for infrastructure. Uh, we know that it can drive the economy. We know it puts people back to work. We know it spurs economic development. We know it expands tax base, right? To expand tax base, that's better for all taxpayers. Uh, so a lot of opportunity, uh, just knocking whatever I'm knocking on. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we're going to be able to figure out a way to, to get the money there. Yeah, because I, I think it's desperately needed. I mean, you know, I think about it in, in 30 years. So I used to be stationed in California and uh, flew, flew back from California to New York a bunch of times, and I just recently flew out to California back again. Same flight, same time, same issues. We haven't really progressed in terms of quality of life, in terms of infrastructure. In fact, flights take longer to take off, and trains take longer, and there's all this stuff. So I think we do need to start making that, uh, you know, those investments. So where do you see the growth? Where do you see the pockets of growth? So you guys have branched off of Long Island, clearly, right? right? And mm -hmm. you're pretty much in the tri-state area. Is yeah. that where you would be? Yeah. And where do you see the growth? What areas are you guys really seeing as red hot right now? So, uh, yeah, we're, uh, we've got four, we've got five New York State offices and two New Jersey offices. Uh, our reach is is. Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. A uh, lot of growth, Maryland, a lot of growth, Virginia, a lot of growth into Pennsylvania, a lot of growth in Florida. Um, it's, I, I just had a, a meeting on Friday where I presented my five-year vision plan to the shareholders of the company. Um, took a look at five-year, 10-year, where I see growth for H2M. And, uh, you know, our growth has been, um, you know, kind of urban sprawlish, yeah. where we've got a very strong base in New York, and we're continuing to build off of that base. So even our acquisitions have not been, you know, a California or a Florida or a Texas. Um, it's been kind of building on our on our base, doing what we do really, really well, and then figuring out ways to kind of move that. Um, so you know, I I think continued growth in the Northeast for us as a company is going to be strong. Uh, the demand is there. Infrastructure is a national issue. Uh, so, you know, for companies like ours, there's, there's a lot of opportunities. There are some communities where the, the design professional 
is is you know that's where the limitation is. Yeah. You know, you don't have enough contractors or enough engineers to go ahead and, and get the work to go. Uh, so I I I look at at the opportunities for growth regionally. Uh, I also think there are going to be some nice national opportunities for us to grow and. Uh, I would expect over the next 10 years we would have some offices in some other places throughout the country. That's great. So when you're looking at your five-year plan, right, is it based on, you know, contracts that you have that you can scale out and figure out how long they're going to work for, you know, potential projects that you're working on and you give them a percentage? Uh, I'm assuming that's how you do it, but how much of it is just overall growth? Like how much optimism do you guys Put into this. Um, the the five-year plan is 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 based on a number of things. That's that's one of them. Uh, what we've done. Uh, I'll go back to to pre-recession. Yeah. So pre-recession, we had a certain business approach, and our business approach was uh, we have architects that do architecture. We have water waste water engineers that do that. Environmental engineers that do that. Civil engineers, uh, and we were looking at our business opportunities from a discipline perspective. Uh, so going into the recession, where we were really fortunate, uh, very diversified in our service offerings and the markets we were in, we didn't have to lay people off. You know, a lot of the other engineers and architects were, were struggling significantly, had to yeah, lay sure. people off. Uh, we were fortunate we didn't have to do that. Um, as markets were down, we were able to reassign people. And as markets came up, and other markets, got, you know, public sector started to go down when private sector started to come back. Uh, so during that period, we identified the major markets that we provide services to and you know, ended up you know, 10 markets that were strong for us. So we put people in charge of those markets. So now I have market directors, a technical person, it could be an engineer or an architect who has responsibility for the education market. So now that person is the one who comes to me to say, okay, you know, this is my vision for 2018. Yep. I think we're gonna be able to do this. And here's my five-year vision. So what I'm doing is going to all the market directors, getting their vision for their markets, bringing that all together and seeing how we can put that into a corporate vision, uh, which I, I spent the better part of 2017 putting the vision plan together. So from a geographic expansion perspective, resources, just revenue, you know, um, we're, we're, we're probably, uh, I think our budget for 18 is going to be, from a net revenue point of view, maybe $62 million. Right. Uh, in, in five years, I'm hoping to be a $90 million company. Uh, and that's all based on a lot of my interaction with everybody who really knows their markets inside and out. So my confidence is, is good yeah. uh, with that. And the growth projections are not crazy. Um, we've grown crazy over the last three or four years, so I'm kind of tempering yeah. what I see, that the view moving forward. But that's really not through a lack of confidence. I just think we're not capable of growing like we've been over the last three years. We need to kind of get our feet under us a little bit. So... Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident. It's nerve-wracking, right, when you grow <laughs> that quickly over those years and you're waiting for the shoe to drop. Because totally. we, had, we had a very similar path, and I'm kind of trying to level things out a little bit now yeah. and see where it, where it settles out. But it's great. I mean, it's great, it's great stuff. It's better than the, uh, the alternative. So for you, right, day to day, how, how much time do you spend with uh, customers? How much time do you spend with staff? How much time do you spend in planning? What's, what's a normal day to day for a chair? Um, so yes, I'm still involved with clients, yep. a number of clients that um, I've, I've had for 20 years. And uh, clearly, I, I, to me, I think it's important to stay connected to clients because you're, you're going to hear things from them that you might not hear from coworkers or, or uh, really any employee. Uh, so I, I think that's important. So I, I do that. Yep. Not every day, uh, but I'll do it when I need to. I still attend client meetings and things like that, and I think that's important. Uh, I'm still involved in technical organizations. I still want to keep myself connected to uh, a lot of the technical expertise that H2M has. So I'm still very involved in a lot of technical organizations. Uh, as you know, I'm involved in business organizations and community organizations. But I, I, I look at it probably like, um, like steering the ship, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, staying connected with all of my key reports, with all the market directors, with division leadership, uh, you know, staying connected with, every, with all the office leaders so that uh, I've got a really strong sense of what's happening throughout the, the company. You know, we're, we're 400 people now. So it, it's, um, it's more, getting more difficult to stay really connected. Right. So I rely heavily on, uh, you know, those that are really connected to me to stay really connected. Uh, I, I, I'll have, um, I've got weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings with all my 
you know, kind of key executive team so that I'm always up to date, you know, operations, you know, any issues that I need to know about. Uh, my HR director does a great job keeping me clued into what's happening. If there are any kind of staff issues or any grumblings out yep. there that I need to deal with. Um, and I, I communicate very regularly with the company. Uh, I do my own internal video communications. I'm constantly communicating, uh, you know, with the employees as, as much as I can. Uh, so, uh, you know, day to day is, is more just keeping on top of everything and making sure that if everybody else is doing what they need to do, then that means that I'm doing the things that I need to do. So um, challenges on Long Island, right? So what do we do, right? Where do we prioritize our time and our dollars at this point? To me, infrastructure is critical. What infrastructure do you think is the priority? Where, where does Long Island head over the next five years towards prosperity? Uh, you know, we, we, we've heard a lot about sewer infrastructure in Suffolk County. Uh, that's critical, uh, still needs to happen from really two perspectives. One is environmental protection, and you've heard a lot about you know, water quality and, and whether it's uh, the aquifer system or estuaries and surface water bodies. Uh, that's important, you know, but also to drive economic development is, is just as important. They really go hand in hand. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy about the fact that there's a lot of attention on sewer infrastructure out in Suffolk County. Uh, but there's also a need to, you know, a lot of our infrastructure in Nassau County is, you know, developed 100 years ago. Yep. You know, so all of your underground infrastructure and, and bridges, uh, and, you know, you can drive down any number of roads in Nassau County and go underneath an overpass and go, wow, that's, wow, look at the rust on that bridge, right? And, um, but that's where the, the, the competition with dollars comes into play. Uh, so I think just a, a, a recognition of the need to have to, Upgrade our infrastructure in, in a, a reasonable way, not, not crazy dollars, but a reasonable way. And uh, all of our local governments, I think, do a really good job at, at budgeting for that. And I think they're trying to stick to that. Uh, the, the sewer infrastructure is going to be important. Yep. Uh, so I'm looking forward to you know, some opportunities that are going to be created from you know, us investing there also. That's great. And folks, we were joined today with uh, Rich Human, President and CEO of H2M uh, Architects and Engineers. Rich, I have to tell you, it's always a pleasure to spend time with you. You're a, you're a wealth of knowledge in a world that I just don't have a lot of transparency uh, into, and I'm sure all of our viewers really appreciated all of your insights today. So I want to thank you. Um, it, you were terrific. Anytime. So, thanks, absolutely. Thanks, and thanks, sir. folks. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll be back next time. Good job. You're obligated to protect public safety and working in water or wastewater and, and those things that people touch in their day-to-day -day lives that they, they don't even realize how important and precious and scarce those resources might end up being um, is something that when you take a step back and look at the work that we do and the opportunity that we have to, to protect our environment and to protect you know, public health, uh, it's, it's really humbling to think that, that we could have just like a tiny impact on how the rest of the world, you know, perceives drinking water. It, it's, it's incredible to be part of, and, and when you take a moment to think about it, it, it really does make you step back and think like, wow, this is just really, really important. I'm really proud to be part of a company that has been around and strong since 1933. I mean, 85 years of any company is an achievement, and it's a testament to the work that's done and the people that work in the company. You don't get that far without doing something right. But I look at that and say, that's the first 85 years. What are we going to do? What are we going to look like in the next 85 years from now?